1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. But the manifestations of the Spirit, notice it's a capital S. What does that signify? God, deity. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through, I'm just going to say it the way I read it, okay? One is given the word of wisdom through the Holy Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Holy Spirit. To another, faith by the same Holy Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Holy Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. And to another, discerning of spirits. I'm only going to address one of those today, and that is the discerning of spirits. How many of you, when you saw the title, you thought, hmm, not sure what's going to happen, but i got to check this one out. I've already had people ask me for the notes, okay? Hadn't even preached it yet. So this gift unveils the spiritual realm. That is the purpose of the discerning of spirits is that it gives us insight into the unseen realm. Too many people have the ideology that the spirit realm is something far, far off, and it's not. It's not. The, the, the spirit realm is right here. It's right here. I mean, it is, it is all around us. And if we miss that, and we think that there's, watch this, this is a word that will trigger some of you. If we think there's only certain portals by which the enemy or the Lord can access and come through, we're missing it. Okay? The spirit realm is at, we are in the midst of it, okay? We're, we're, we're like meatballs in the spaghetti. Everywhere there's spaghetti, that's the spirit realm. We just happen to meet the meatballs, Okay? So it's, it's absolutely all around us, but it's invisible to our natural senses, and it takes a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit to make that visible to us. The discerning of spirits, both words in that are plural in the Greek. So if you hear me sometimes say discernings of spirits or discerning of spirits, it's, it's the same thing, okay? Okay. Um, the nine gifts of the Spirit are not necessarily something that a believer can use at will. It's something that the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to use this gift for you or through you for the benefit of others. So it is a gift that you carry that God activates when he wants to use it. Does that make sense? So, in this particular gift, God gives the believer the ability to recognize and distinguish between types or kinds of spirits. And you go, well, how many kinds and types of spirits are there? When Adam and, and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, he enjoyed unveiled interaction. The Bible says that he saw God face to face. They communicated. They walked together in the garden. And so when he sinned, in Genesis 3, 23, it says that God drove them out from the garden and he no longer had access or no longer operated in the higher spiritual dimension that he did before he sinned. He could no longer see God face to face. Sin had now brought a separation, and he could no longer see the spiritual world. Now, we, he could still see the effects of the spiritual world, just like you and I can see the effects of the spiritual world. That's the state that we find ourselves in today, one that is widely known as the fall of man or fallen man. So a restoration of bringing paradise back has been ongoing since Adam's sin. Jesus dealt with the root problem 2,000 years ago at the cross. And in Revelation 21, verse 3, John foresaw the day when he says, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tabernacle of God is with men. He dwells with him in closer relationship even than Adam understood. See, in the garden, Adam walked with God. 
he saw God. But in our New Testament covenant, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. So he's walking and talking with me all the time, just like he is for those that are, that are uh, available to him and have received him. With the gift of discerning of spirits, the veil is, is somewhat pulled back and we can perceive, that's a funny word, but perceive the spiritual realm. And it happens in a moment. See, during worship, I just caught the back of Carrie's head. And just seeing the back of Carrie's head, the Lord just dropped what I gave her in my spirit. So I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a time for that, Lord. You catch what I'm saying? It wasn't me looking around the room like, who can I pick on today? That, that's too much of me. And so this, this was God choosing to say, I'm going to give you a word of knowledge for Carrie because I want this now to be Carrie's moment. That wasn't up to me. Do you follow? Because some of you come to church or you'll come to a prophetic meeting and you'll get hacked off that everybody else got a word and you didn't get one. Not always up to us. So all the gifts of the Spirit are for an occasion. 1 Corinthians 13 describes the current state of things in verse 9 when it says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. I'll tell you, this is, this is personal. So there are times that I might have an understanding. I might have known something, saw a post on Facebook that you made or something, and so I recognize you're in a bad spot. And because you're in a bad spot, empathy may arise on the inside of me, and I can pursue God and ask him, is there something, Lord, that I can say to them that would be a blessing and encouragement to them? That's still up to God as to whether or not he decides to do that. But I believe that many times if when, when my heart is pure towards them, right, that I just want them to be blessed, I know they're in a bad spot, I don't necessarily believe that God's going to withhold that. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily start it. He caused me to see whatever I saw or heard or, you know what I'm saying? So all of that works together as far as I'm concerned. But I can't necessarily just jump out there and decide I'm going to give words. If, if God doesn't release that and activate that in me for you, I've got nothing. Does that make sense? I want to take the, the mystery out of this. Um, so we know in part and prophesy in part. So the same principle applies even to the discerning of spirits. See, God gives us a glimpse of what we need to know. We don't always see it all. There's also been times, like, for instance, I'll pick on Carrie since I've already started with her. So it, it might be that God says, okay, I have a word that I want to release to Carrie. Okay, Lord, what is it? Well, you just call her out and I'll let you know. I don't like those. I've had them, but I don't enjoy them. You know what I mean? And so sometimes I might have to, hey, Carrie, I just believe the Lord's got a word for you. Okay, God. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a little bit, that causes a little consternation in my life. But I think God does that with me sometimes just to test, just to test me. You know what I mean? Because too often, we want to know the whole thing. Watch this. Even though I released the word that I gave to her, I still don't know what it is I'm talking about. I don't know what it is. It's not important that I know. And for those of you that get really creeped out that some, well, you're going to come up and he said something to me, and oh my gosh, he read my mail and said blah, 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 blah. When I go home, I don't know what I told you. It doesn't matter to me what I told you. All I am is UPS or FedEx for the Holy Spirit. All I got to do is take what he says, hand it to you, and I'm done. So some of you getting so backward, praying and saying, God, please don't, please don't have him give me word. Please don't let him call me out. Please, I, I don't want him to know all that stuff. And just because I release a word to you does not mean that I know anything other than what he said. And most of the time, I'm not going to remember that. We see in part, we prophesy in part. See, if we could see in the spirit realm all the time, we'd get very disenchanted with the physical realm. We wouldn't want to have anything to do with what's going on in the physical because all we want to do is pay attention to what's happening in the spiritual. So God doesn't allow us to see all of that all of the time. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. 
And we get, I don't know about you, but when I hear this scripture, it's like, oh, come on, can we please not go through that helmet of salvation? Right, way to right. Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing. He, he instructs us to put on all of it. When winter shows up and it's icy cold outside and you put on all your winter clothes except the boots. None of the rest of the stuff you put on is going to make any difference. You're still going to get all kinds of cold and wet. Why? Because your feet are uncovered. You have to put on the whole armor of God. Watch this. For it to all be effective. Sometimes when you're, when you're riding a, a motorcycle in inclement weather, they have, they have pants now that zip to the top of the boots. And then they got jackets that zip to the pants. So it makes it almost like a onesie. Right? Why? To keep the elements out. But if you're all zipped up from the toes all the way up to your waist and you forgot to zip this part up and you catch a big gust of wind, I don't understand it, but wind has the ability to come in and go whoo, right up underneath your shirt. You know what I'm saying? You get wet and cold all kinds of places. and you feel, How in the world does that happen? I'm wearing this heavy jacket. So when he says put on the whole armor, it's important that we don't just, oh, well, I know what all those pieces are. Great. But put them on together. Okay? Then he goes on in verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I did tell you this story about Chris Valaton. He, he brought this up and half the prophets in his prophetic meeting got mad and walked out. Why? Because they wanted to use the prophetic word as a weapon to dress down people. And thinking that they're honoring God by doing Anyway, moving on. So, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What are these heavenly places that he's referring to? It's the spiritual realm. Jack Hayford once said that, that it's a foot above our head. It's a foot above our head. We're constantly in the midst of it. It's not some far off place. So the realm of reality can be perceived when the Holy Spirit manifests discerning of spirits. So this discerning of spirits enables us to not only perceive the presence of spirits, but also what their nature is. I've had it before where I've gone to certain places and I find myself physically nauseous. And didn't know why. Got into some conversations and I felt anger. And watch this. At first I thought it was me being angry. Took me a while to figure out I was sensing anger. Wasn't mine, but I felt it. Y'all ain't hearing that yet. Discerning of spirits kind of lets us know. There's, there's been times where we've had struggle, and I, I, I brought this up in the last week or two, where witches have literally showed up to this house and this building with the intent of disrupting the atmosphere. So sometimes you think, well, was it something I ate? You know, is, is this that junk that's going around right now, this mental fog and all, blah, 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 all this stuff? When I got done with that, uh, with that big bonfire yesterday, just wetting the ground around about it, as we were leaving, I knew I was dehydrated, and so got some liquid in me and went home, and while I'm home, my sinuses started shutting down, started feeling stuff on the back of my throat, and the first thing I thought was, oh, this must be that crud that's going around. So about 4 a.m., I'm still struggling to sleep, and it just occurred to me, I'm going to give this a go. And so I, I just prayed out loud. I said, I take authority over all sickness, illness, and disease, every curse, every lie that's arrayed against me physically. I demand your resignation right now by the name and the blood of the Lamb. My throat started clearing up. <laughs> now... I did shoot up with a little bit of nasal spray. But that was at 4 a.m. So 
So it brought a whole nother. I wonder how many times that we let the devil in because we didn't catch it. I was speaking to somebody at the, at the men's thing this weekend. And he was talking about how his family property, a lot of acres, had been stolen by another. I'm just. And I said, well, you know, the Bible says that when you catch a thief in the act, he's got to pay back sevenfold. I said, instead of bemoaning what's missing, how about you start celebrating God for over the 500 acres that's coming to you? And he said, you know what? I'm going to pray about that. that. That bears witness with me. And then as I walked off, the Lord said to me, do you know that that would never happen if he didn't catch them? All of a sudden, my mind starts going crazy. How many times have we been stolen from? Watch, our health, our sanity, our relationships, our finances, we've been stolen from, but because we didn't see and or catch the thief, they got away with it. Let me give you an example. If you are an adolescent kid and you're just trying to prove how cool you are, so you go into the video store or you go into the music store and you pocket a couple of CDs or DVDs and you walk out, if you don't get caught, you don't pay the price. But if you get caught, you're going to jail, you're going to get booked, you're going to get arrested, your parents are going to get called. All this kind of stuff goes on, right? Watch this. So a thief comes into your life and steals a promotion, steals an inheritance, steals whatever, fill in the blank. But because you didn't perceive and or identify that this was an attack of the enemy, Oh, well, you know, I'll get more later. The only way you make the devil pay back sevenfold is to catch him. You know what that means? That means we can't be snoozing. We can't, we can't be dependent on somebody else to watch after us. We, we have to be paying attention to our own life, our own house, our own money, our own job, our own everything. Why? Because we have to catch the thief. Save that for another day because I probably ain't going to use that another day. So discerning of spirits, we need to identify whether or not the spirit that we're dealing with or sensing is God, if it's angels, if it's a human spirit, or, it's, or if it's evil spirits. I remember there was a season when I was living in the duplex, I was, I was harassed, I was tormented. I literally saw beings walking around through the, through the house. And, man, I was breaking stuff, casting stuff down, repenting over stuff, casting everything off. It, it didn't stop. And I thought, God, what is this? And all of a sudden it occurred to me it wasn't a demonic spirit. It was a human spirit. Y'all heard of this little thing called astral projection? So I handled that completely different. And wouldn't you know it, it stopped. Discerning of spirits is vastly important. So what happens when you get a revelation or a discernment that what you're dealing with is a spirit of God or angels? Typically, that is, that is for our encouragement or for our guidance, okay? In 2 Kings 6, we have the example of Elisha. How many knows the story of Elisha? So Elisha through words of knowledge, had been exposing the strategies of the enemy of the king of Syria. And so he'd go back and he'd tell the king of Israel, hey, the Lord has shared with me what's going on in the enemy's camp. They're planning this, 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 and this. So the king of Syria is getting hacked off because the king of Israel always seems to know their plans. And so now... The king of Syria just gets mad. He said, forget it. We're going. We're going now. Get up all the armies. Let's go surround them at Dothan. So they come out there and they surround them. So the Bible says that Elisha's servant slid out of bed one morning, walked outside, went, because he was surrounded by the Syrian army. He knew in the natural 
The Dothan army had no chance against the Syrian forces. He knew it. So he cried out to Elisha, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha's not sweating bullets at all. Now, I, I, there's something that struck me about this story in this reading, of all the times I've read this, in this reading that, I, that I'm not quite sure about. I don't know that Elisha saw the angelic hosts. His servant did. Because he said, Lord, first of all, he told the servant, he said, there's more with us than there is with them. Don't sweat it. God, would you please show him? And the Bible says his eyes were opened and he could see the angelic hosts round about, fiery you know, chariots and horses and angelic hosts all over the place. And when he saw that, he's like, <laughs> right? I'm not convinced Elisha saw it, but I am convinced that Elisha discerned it. Oh. You, you catch that? Sometimes so we, have this, we have this thing today. Seeing is believing. I'm not convinced that Elisha had to see it. I think Elisha discerned it and he knew, but his servant needed to see. Kind of like all the, all the apostles were doubting Thomas. He was able to discern the angelic hosts. There's two ways we can see angels. One, they take natural form, and we can see them in the natural. Or secondly, the, the spirit of discernment will cause us to either recognize them or see them. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. In Acts 27, an angel appeared to Paul when he was on a ship. The ship came into a terrible storm, was about to sink. The crew panicked. They threw cargo overboard, hoping to survive. So the angel appeared to Paul with a word of assurance and that the ship would be lost, but he and those that followed him would, would make it. So, see, nobody on that ship saw the angel except Paul. Nobody heard the angel except Paul. And in this particular instance, the discerning of spirits operated in conjunction with the word of wisdom and prophecy as he told the others what was going to happen. And that brought encouragement and guidance to those that were yet on the ship. So the discerning of spirits is perceiving good spirits as well as evil spirits. It's also active and revelatory knowledge that comes from God. I have noticed that discernment many times works hand in hand with, with other gifts. Discerning of spirits is under the heading of prophetic gifts. There's, there's discerning of spirits, there's words of knowledge, there's words of encouragement, there's prophecy as, as far as foretelling and forthtelling. Do you guys understand the difference between foretelling and forthtelling? Foretelling is saying this is going to happen. Forthtelling is prophesying in such a way that because you said it, it caused it to happen. So there's forth telling. Anyway, the, the discerning of spirits really is a, a prophetic type gift, su such as words of knowledge and words of wisdom. So many times they work hand in hand. How many ever been trying to get a, a nut off on, a, on an engine and it keeps, the one behind it keeps moving, so you have to get a what? A second wrench. And working together works like that way in the spirit. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah was worshiping at the temple when the veil was pulled back for him and he was able to see into the spirit realm. And in verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He also saw seraphim, which is a high order of angels. And what did that revelation of the Lord do for Isaiah? It confirmed to him who was really in charge. Isn't it amazing that even today, when we hear bad stuff, well, we don't know who's going to get elected president. We don't know what's going to happen with our economy. We don't know if they're going to just go digital currency. We don't know if, if there's going to be shortage. We don't, all this stuff. Has God ever failed? Ever. If the worst of the worst of the worst that you can imagine happened, did God abdicate his throne for that to happen, or does he still have a plan for his remnant? 
So he, th- this is part of what this, this gift was for, was to bring encouragement to Isaiah saying, listen, I'm still king. <laughs> I don't care what's happening in your little puny realm. I'm still in charge. These kinds of revelations usually come when you really need them, not necessarily when you want them. I've seen people go to prophetic meeting after prophetic meeting after prophetic meeting in the hopes that they're going to get a word. It's almost like they become groupies for the prophetic. And it's not infrequent that they don't get one. So then I ask them, what's the last word you got? Well, I got that five years ago, but that never came to pass. Oh. Could it be that the Lord is letting you know that because you weren't faithful with the last one he gave you, why is he going to give you another one? Could it be if we go back and revisit what the Lord said the last time and work on that, that it would open up the next? I'm sorry, I thought it was at no excuses. Let me move on. Maybe the most important discernment that we can have is, is discerning the Lord. This doesn't always come in a kind of way. There's a song we used to sing, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the touch of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Sometimes in our senses we begin to doubt that God still loves us, still cares, still got our back, still providing for us, still conscious of where we are. We begin to doubt the scripture that says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you even to the end of the age. Our flesh gets tired, gets weak, gets overwhelmed. Then you walk into a place that's really worshiping. And all of a sudden you begin to feel something in the atmosphere shift. I'm going to be really transparent with you. Sometimes you may come in carrying stuff that's just overwhelming. And sometimes you might actually come just out of straight habit because you know you should do it. Sometimes you may not be hungry, but you know you haven't eaten all day or in two or three days. You know it's probably prudent that you should do something, you know, eat something. So you eat, not watch this, not because you're hungry, but because you know you need it. So sometimes people will come to church not necessarily because they feel like it or because they're excited about it or any other motivation other than the fact that it's just something I know I should do. So you come in and depressed, angry, sad, sorrowful, whatever, and then people are worshiping around you and their worship almost irritates you. Don't you know where I'm at? What's going? Why, can you just tone it down just a little bit? I, I'm trying to... You're trying to what? You ever been really mad at somebody and they didn't want you mad at them so they got you laughing and then you got mad that you were laughing? That's how some people are in worship. They're here because they know they should be here, but they want to do this in the spirit like, well, I'm not praising, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just not. But other people are just loving the Lord and so if she's really worshiping and she's all hacked off, so the Lord goes, well, I'm just going to come sit right between them. <laughs> so now she's sensing and feeling the presence of God even though she doesn't want to while this one is bringing. That's why it's important who you sit with. Y'all ain't hearing anything at all. It's important who you hang out with, who you sit with, who you sit around, who you let sit around you because they're carrying something and you're carrying something. You need to make sure what it is that you're carrying and what they're carrying. <laughs> I'm skipping a little bit. You know, as a, on a purely human level, we have the ability to discern some things. 
If somebody walks in just, well, I perceive that you're angry. <laughs> right? There's some things that we just know in the natural by looking at them. If they walk in, you know, like they lost their dog, you know, kicking little stones all the way, you go, it looks like you must be having a really bad day. I pulled through Brahms yesterday, ordered some shakes. You could tell with the attitude that was on the microphone. Yes, you want what? Well, okay, what size? Mm -hmm. All right, pull first window. I thought, well, she's having a lovely day. So I get up to the window and said, hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? I said, well, I think you just lied to me. Wasn't no spiritual discernment. That was, that was a hu human discernment. Now, I will say this. I have noticed that God has allowed human discernment to kick off spiritual discernment for me. For instance, I may see somebody that's out of sorts in the natural, and it catches my eye. And because that catches my eye, God goes, now let me talk to you about them. Then, this, then, the, then the discerning of spirits kicked in because I saw something that didn't match in the natural. There are things that happen that may catch our eye. I'll give you another example. This is kind of funny, but it's actually true. So sometimes people go into, especially at prophetic conferences, they wear the loudest, brightest, most neon shirt or blingage, so that they, you cannot help but see them. You know what I mean? If they can't sit on the front row, bless God, when that light hits them, they're going to, woo, they're going to light up, right? Because they, they want to be seen. And sometimes the Lord will just give discernment and say, listen, that's, com that's completely flesh. They don't need nothing. They need to do what I told them to do last time. They're trying to get a new word to override the last one, so don't tell them nothing. Some, sometimes that backfires. In Matthew 12, 34, it says, you offspring of vipers, how can you speak good things when you're evil and wicked? For out of the fullness, which is the overflow, the superabundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Body language will tell you a lot. Tone will tell you a lot. I'm fine. How are you? You ain't fine, and you don't care about me. How do I know that? Tone. Those acts of human discernment is not what I'm referencing when I'm saying the spirit of discernment. Natural clues can help us get an idea that we need to pay attention, but that in and of itself is not the revealing of spirits. That is a gift that is only given to and activated by God. So what about the discerning of a human spirit? Look with me, please, in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 beginning at verse 43. The Bible says, The next day Jesus decided to go into Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. As my disciple, accepting me as your master and teacher and walking the same path of life that I walk. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one, Moses, in the law, and also the prophets wrote about Jesus from Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel answered him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's like us saying, can anything good come out of Stillwater? <laughs> so Nathaniel answered him. <laughs> you like that one, did you? <laughs> of all the things I said, you like that one. So can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip replied, come and see. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Here's an Israelite indeed, a true descendant of Jacob, in whom there is no guile or deceit nor duplicity. And Nathanael said to Jesus, How do you know these things about me? And Jesus responded, Before Philip called you, when you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, which is teacher, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. And Jesus replied, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, that's what causes you to believe me? You will see greater things than this. And then he said to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
who's the bridge between heaven and earth. How did Jesus know about Nathaniel? He perceived by the Holy Spirit that his spirit had no guile. When Paul was preaching in Lystra, there was a man in the crowd that was lame from birth. And that caught Paul's attention. And by discerning of spirits, Paul understood that the, the lame man had faith to be healed. Here's, here's a problem I have. We have people that will say, well, if God wants me healed, he'll call me out. Or, well, I've been called out 5,000 times. I still ain't healed. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's one or the other. Um, Paul was able to discern that the, in the, the man's spirit, there was faith to receive the healing. We were in Norman, my family and I, and Brad was ministering. And there was a guy that was in a, a wheelchair that particular night. And Brad called him out and said, the Lord told me that if you will say yes to him, you'll walk. And he said, do you want to be healed? And the man said, no. Did he walk? No. Why? Because God's not going to force a healing on you. Let me say it like this. God's not going to force you to pray, praise, worship, laugh, jump, leap, be joyful. God's not going to force any of that on you. But Paul, using the gift of discerning of spirits that God activated in his life for this moment, he said, I perceive that this man has the faith to take the healing. And so he spoke to him and said in Acts 14, 10, stand up straight on your feet. And he stood up and got so excited he went out leaping and walking through the place. It was discerning of spirits that initiated that healing for him. You know, there's been a number of prophetic words that have been released even inside this house that still have not come to fulfillment. Why is that? There could be a lot of reasons, but I decided to give you a short list. One, it could be that the word that you received is not the plan that you desired for your, your own life. You haven't yet fully surrendered to his plan for you. You still want God to honor your plan for you. Secondly, you might be upset that something that you were contemplating privately was made public. I'm going to say this about that. God will never release a word to you publicly that will shame or embarrass you. God already knows your heart. He already knows your response. He already knows your need. And he will not release a word publicly through anybody to call you out for whatever reason that's going to shame or embarrass you. But I remember in Moore, Nigel was ministering and we were, we were there visiting. And he called me out and said, your business is going to go lower and lower and lower. And the ministry is going to go higher and higher and higher. And that irritated me. It did. It had been one thing if he had said that to me in private, I'd still been irritated, but now I'm even more irritated because now I've got all these witnesses. <laughs> and then, sometime later, we were, we were in uh, the cafe on 59th Street, and Brad was there. And he called Rachel and I out, and he said, Joel, I hear the Lord saying that I'm sending you back to the denomination that you left. I went down on my knees like this, and I was going like this. 
No. No, 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 no. Huh? Wasn't, wasn't what I wanted for me. Now, the, the Lord since gave me a little liberty because he said I'm sending you to, not in. Big difference. Hallelujah. You may need to hear a particular word repeatedly through different prophetic voices to allow your faith to latch hold of God's word. You know how many times i got to tell people, I really do love you, you really are beautiful, you really are handsome, you really are smart and skilled, you really are wanted, you really are desired. You know how many times I have to tell people repeatedly and repeatedly, and watch, they, many times they'll dismiss it because they expect that that's something that should come out of my mouth, not necessarily something that really is, but just I'm trying to make them feel good. Listen, there's too many ways to encourage you. I don't have to lie to do it. Another reason is you may agree with the word, but not necessarily the timing. I remember back in Moore, Nigel told me, he said, I hear the Lord saying, Joel, he said, you need to run, and you need to run fast, because he said, you're almost too late. That word hit me. And then with the crescendo, he said, I hear the Lord saying, go big or go home. Do this or don't do this, but pick one. Here's another one. You might feel like you're not God's first pick for that particular call or position. So you get irritated. Oh, Oh, God, you're down to 5,621. You're down to me. Where's Stephen? Stephen just got a promotion. Um, he got promoted back to, go ahead, give it up for him. That's good. His first promotion, watch this, took him out of church on Thursday nights. Got him a pay raise, but jacked with his sleep schedule. And I think he was gone, what was it, four weeks? I told him when he got it, I said, you do what you got to do. But I said, this ain't going to last long. <laughs> Four weeks later, somebody on day shift got demoted. Which made an opportunity for him to get promoted. Y'all need to hear this. Because this happens in ministry. This happens in, in, in gifts and callings and all kinds of stuff. While the gifts and callings may not be without repentance. Which means they're still there. If you continually choose not to function in the gifts and callings that God's given you, he's not going to let the work suffer because you refuse to use what he gave you. So he'll raise somebody else up to take, and take what you were supposed to do and supersede what you would have done because you didn't do it. So never get upset. Well, I wasn't God's first choice. If you're getting promoted, you're the choice that matters, right? Right? So celebrate every promotion that you get from the Lord. Sometimes discerning of spirits reveals a negative condition in the human spirit. In Acts 8, Peter discerned the condition of Simon, his spirit. He saw that it was poisoned with bitterness. He said, well, how can that, how can that be a positive thing? I'm going to tell you what. It is very difficult to be proficient at deliverance without discernment. I'm going to say that again. It is very difficult to be proficient at deliverance without discernment. Discernment is the secret ingredient to seeing people set free. Because you need to be able to discern, A, what their spirit is doing, and B, what the demonic spirits are doing, and see what it is that the Holy Spirit wants to do. And all of this functions through the discerning of spirits. Sometimes I walk by people and I know stuff that I didn't even ask to know. Didn't ask for it. In some instances, I think I might be better off if I didn't know. But yet... People don't walk in freedom. Yeah, you guys are old enough to remember Rubik's Cubes? Yeah. Huh? How many ever had one? How many learned the trick to get it back to where it's supposed to be? 
How many like me just got frustrated and just broke it, took it apart and snapped them back in place? Huh? Exactly. So many times God says, here's the combination that will write them. But too often, they've been to people, watch this, that have tried and it just scrambled them more. And so now they're too timid to even really come with full faith of any kind to say, I really expect that God's going to bring healing, restoration, deliverance, freedom, and all that stuff into my life. Why? Because I've been so scrambled. But when God says, Turn the top one twice. Turn the bottom one once. Turn the middle one four times. That's what happens in discernment. They're dealing with bitterness that came from abuse that started in the family and now is in the workplace. Got a combination right there. And God released that in that moment for that person. Why? Because that's what would fix them. Mark 16, 17, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Deliverance is an essential part of the New Testament ministry. I'm going to say it like this. Deliverance is not an optional part of New Testament ministry. This is an illustration from a pastor. He said, when I lived in Dallas, I got my introduction to discerning of spirits and deliverance ministry. He said, at the end of one evening service, he was praying deliverance for a man who had come to the service and the demons were not coming out. His pastor was. And the, the demons were not coming out, so he turned to me and told me to help him pray. So I grabbed the man's hand and started praying. And suddenly I saw six demons leave the man, one after the other. And once the first one left, the others were right behind him. The discernment was very clear and distinct. Six dingy white spirits full of agitation fleeing the scene. I thought, this is cool. I didn't know it was possible to see them in that way. He says, I was feeling excited when I went home that night. I lived in an apartment by myself, and when I got in bed, I lay there on my back looking up, and there circling over me were those same six spirits. I knew almost nothing about dealing with them, but my pastor had told them to go, so I did that. But they didn't go. Even when I got more emotional and told them to leave me alone, they still wouldn't go. Listen, just because you scream it doesn't make it any more. Anyway, moving on. So after a while, I had enough, and I decided to get out of there and leave it with them. So I got in my car, and I drove away, and finally, a little peace. But no, (laughs) no. There they were right with me. I was driving all over Dallas trying to lose them, and they were causing all kinds of manifestations. Cats were running in front of me doing flips. I was freaking out. I finally drove to my pastor's house, he said. It was about midnight. I woke him up and told him what was going on. He prayed for me and put me to bed on his couch, and I never had any more trouble with those demons. But one thing I learned, you cannot outrun them in a car. That... And my mind speaks to trespassing spirits. Have you noticed that when, in Scripture, when the demoniac was getting free and Jesus was speaking to them and said, have you come to torment us before our time? said, let us go into the pigs. You want to know why that was important? They wanted to stay in this realm. They wanted to stay in the earthly realm. And they knew that if Jesus sent them to hell before their time, 
that they wouldn't have the necessary time in order to take people to hell. This is the time that we have to send them to hell. That's why when I, when I deal or address demonic spirits, I tell them, you, you and all your cohorts, you link yourselves together by the name of the shed blood of Jesus, you go straight to the pit that you crawled out of and you stay there until your day of judgment. Why? Because I don't want to have to deal with the same devil twice. When I first started getting into deliverance ministry, I didn't understand all that, and I'd pray for this person, and, and the devil would jump to this guy. Then he'd say, oh, I'm feeling the same stuff. Oh, let's come over here and pray. Pray for him. Boom, it bounces over to this one. So now they're, they're free. Come on. Well, what's going on? And the whole night was me getting absolutely run ragged. Oh, here's, here's one that's confused a lot of people. Acts 16. I'm going to tie a bow on this. Paul was ministering in Philippi, and one day on his way to prayer, he encountered a slave girl that was possessed by a spirit of divination. She could tell people's fortune, and that brought her masters a lot of money. And so she started following Paul and Silas around, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaimed us the way of salvation. Is that the truth? Most people would say... Well, she couldn't have a devil because the devil's telling the truth. The devil doesn't tell the truth. Here's what you got to understand. The enemy was trying to confuse people because if they saw that the girl was telling the truth, it made more substantial her fortune telling to them that if she was right about them, she must be right about all the fortune telling. So even though it was the truth, the truth was shrouded in deception. Does that make sense? How do you walk in this? Ephesians 5.18 says it like this. It says, don't get drunk with wine. That's wickedness. It's corruption and stupidity. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by Him. If you're walking in right relationship with him, then he can spin up that gift in you anytime he wants. So we've just got to make ourselves available. So I think too often, how many's ever played golf? How many likes to play golf? How many's ever been a caddy? How many's had a caddy? Okay, what's the purpose of the caddy? Carry the golf clubs. For what purpose? So when you need them, you have them. Too many people see the Holy Spirit as the caddy for them. I'm serious. They really do. And what we've got to see is that we are the caddy for him. So when he says, give me that gift of discernment, I'm going to use that in you right now. We're carrying it. It's a gift to us, but it's for his use. Does that make sense? One more illustration, then I'm going to pray for you. How many knows the name Kenneth Hagin? How many's never heard of Kenneth Hagin? How many didn't vote? In 1953, Kenneth Hagin was ministering in Tyler, Texas. Now, every time I hear Tyler, Texas, I think of R.W. Shanbach. I still hear him saying, send your offerings to Tyler, Texas. Anyway, the pastor's niece had, had lung cancer, and it spread to both lungs and was considered inoperable. So she had wasted away to skin and bones and was bedfast. Hagin was holding healing services in that church every Tuesday and Friday night. That's odd. Every Tuesday and Friday night. So they brought this woman to be prayed for on both nights for the first week and both nights the second week of his services. And Hagen prayed for her, but nothing happened. On the Tuesday of the third week, they brought her again. She was the first in line. 
And this time when Hagen laid his hands on her, the spiritual realm opened up and he saw a demon hanging on to her left lung. And he knew that that was the cause of her affliction. So he commanded the spirit to leave her, and when he did, that spirit fell off of her body on the floor and said back to Hagen, I don't want to leave her, but if you tell me to, I have to leave her. So Hagen then commanded you not only leave her, but you leave these premises. And then the spirit ran down the aisle and out the door, and she was instantly healed. Now, I, while I celebrate that woman's healing, I have to wonder where that devil ran. Her body didn't look any different, but when the doctors took x-rays, they confirmed that all the cancer was gone. And in time, she gained her weight back and recovered her strength. So what does that teach us about the gift of discernment? First, Hagen was incapable of making it happen on his own will. If he had of, she'd have been healed the first two weeks and not the third week. The Holy Spirit manifested by pulling back the curtain and allowing Hagen to see her problem was demonic. Secondly, the demon was directly responsible for that affliction. Not all sickness is because of a devil. But I'll say it like this. Sometimes when we don't address sickness, it's an open door for the devil. About six of you got that. The rest of you are going, what? Thirdly, when she was delivered and healed, she looked no different. <laughs> she looked no different. The cancer was gone, but it took her body time to manifest on the outside what had happened on the inside. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Watch the evidence of things that you cannot see. Discerning of spirits is immensely crucial. If discerning of spirits is not one of your gifts, I would encourage you to ask God for it. If for whatever reason it's still not in your wheelhouse, then I would certainly ask God to put you in relationship with some people that do have it. I'm serious about that. Well, why wouldn't God give it to me? I don't know. I'm not him. What I will say is this. God designed the body of Christ as tongue and groove or cogs and wheels. He wants the fabric of the church to come together because I have a gift that you don't have, but you have a gift that I don't have, and someone else got a gift that we don't have. And so all these gifts, they come together, and they make a fabric called the church. We're not all called to have all the gifts all the time. Everybody needs to know what it's like to be called on and used by God. You guys remember grade school? You remember that far back? I don't know why I was thinking about this, but I remember in, in like kindergarten, we had the blow up alphabet, you know? You blow them up, the big, big, and it had the shelf all the way across. I don't know why I remembered that, but I did. And, um, and, and so each day, the teacher would pick the teacher's helper. Was anybody ever the teacher's helper? Anybody not the teacher's helper? <laughs> y'all were in the office. I know where y'all was at. <laughs> so every once in a while, you get picked. And you got to do what nobody else got to do. You got to go out in the hallway. You got to run errands. You got to violate, you know, all the rules because you had a pass. God wants every person to know what it's like to be the teacher's helper. I think too many of us have relegated ourselves that I'm just going to be the guy that makes the money or the girl that makes the money and I'll, I'll throw money in the plate and that's how we're going to get ministry done. And I'm not minimizing that, but I'm saying every person ought to know what it feels like for God to stick his hand in them and they go, oh, oh, pray for him. Oh, 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 say, say what? Oh, 
Every person ought to know what it's like to be used of God to bring some sort of blessing into the lives of somebody else. For those of you that are catching any part of this stream, I, I, I hope you got blessed in some aspect of this. I hope you learned a little something that you didn't know before. Um, if you're looking for a church home, we're looking to grow the family of God. We meet at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., every Thursday evening at 640, 645 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you and you have an incredible day.